Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. first books of the New Testament, the historical accounts of the Lord Jesus' birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, and his final words following the resurrection. Now, what does the word gospel mean? In in, in a nutshell, uh, it means the good news. Now, there are a lot of other definitions. Some say the message of Jesus. Some say the message of Christianity. Some say it's a designation of something that is absolute truth. I like that definition. Have you ever heard somebody say, that's the gospel truth? And it's a designation that something is an absolute true fact. If you look at, uh, up on the screen, we'll just share with you the book of Romans, the 10th chapter. And it's asking a question in verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel, that preach the gospel, the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. Glad tidings of good things. So we get much of our definition of of the term gospel uh, right there from that particular verse. The gospel is uh, is not bad news. It's not bad news, it's good news. It's not negative, it's, it's tremendously positive. The good, grand, great, and glorious news. How about that? The good, grand, great, and glorious news of the salvation of all through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the basic definition of the gospel. The gospel. When you're sharing the gospel with someone, what does that mean? It means you're sharing the great, grand, glorious good news with them. And, and, and we, have, we have reference of that in 2 Corinthians, uh, the fifth chapter. And it speaks there about all of us being commissioned as ministers of the gospel and the ministry of reconciliation that has been given to us. So uh, that, that there's, a, there's a great uh, great encouragement there and a great, great commissioning there of every believer to proclaim the gospel. Now, we're going to look at each of the gospels really briefly Uh, here this morning, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So let's go back to the book of Matthew, first of all. And let's look right at the end of each of these Gospels. Remember, the Gospels are the record of the birth and the life, and that life includes the ministry. And that's the bulk of each of these Gospels. The birth of the Lord Jesus only takes one chapter, and half that chapter is genealogy where he came from and who he came through. In Matthew chapter 1, we have the birth of Christ. In Matthew chapter 2, we have his early life in chapter 3. And then by chapter 4, he's into the ministry. And from chapter 4 all the way up through Matthew chapter 26, you've got the ministry, the three to three and a half years of ministry of the Lord Jesus. You have him preaching, you have him teaching, you have his parables, you have his prophecies, you have his explanation of the parables, you have miracles, you have the bread and fish, you have him walking on water, you have him healing every manner of sickness and every manner of disease, you have him delivering people, and you have that. Then you have his betrayal and his arrest and his brutal beating and crucifixion and his death, and then you have his burial, and here in the last chapter, then you have his resurrection and his final words. You'll find that exact same pattern in the book of Luke, where you have his birth in chapters 1 and 2, and then you have his genealogy and early life in 3, and then in the ministry, chapter 4. And in Luke, it goes all the way through to the last couple of chapters till again, you have his betrayal and arrest, his crucifixion, his death, burial, his resurrection, and then his last words. Now, in the book of Mark and the book of John, we don't have an account of Mary and Joseph. We don't have an account of his birth. It just starts right off with him in ministry. And in John in particular, it starts off with his water baptism. 
and how that when he was baptized, he watched the Holy Spirit in bodily form come upon him and abide. Now, why was that so, why was that so peculiar? Why was that so special? Why was that so noteworthy that the Holy Spirit would come upon him and abide? It had never happened before. It had never happened before. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people, and the Holy Spirit would, just like putting his hand on a person, and then his hand would, would be, be pulled away. Hand would come upon them, hand would come off of them. No one in the whole history of mankind in over 4,000 years, 4,000, four years from Adam to Jesus' birth, so in over 4,000 and, and 20 some odd years, no one had ever had the Holy Spirit come and abide. Now, Jesus, when he's 30 years old, because all things are done in biblical order, he turns 30, he goes out, John the Baptist baptized him, coming up out of the water. John, the, not John the Baptist, John the Apostle, he writes, I saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him, flutter down like a dove landing, and, and settle on him and not leave. And the one who sent me to baptize in water told me that the one I see the Holy Spirit come upon to abide. That's the Messiah. That's the Lamb of God that came into the world. And I bear this witness. And, and, and so that's what he said. So that you and I, if we pray with an Old Testament mindset, then a lot of times this is what I hear Christians praying out of the Psalms. Because David prayed it, and they think it's a good prayer. And they pray, take not your Holy Spirit from me. The Lord already told you he would come and he'd abide with you forever. The Lord already told you he was going to take up residence and never leave. The Lord already told you he would be with you always, even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit doesn't come upon your life and then leave your life, come into your life and then run away. And you don't have to look through life and say, Holy Spirit, where did you go? I used to feel you so close. Well, you shouldn't be walking by feelings anyway. We walk by faith, not by sight. The Holy Spirit, if you're born again, came in, took up residence, changed you on the inside, and is staying put. John 14 said to abide. He'll never leave, and he's not gone anywhere. Now, you may not feel him, and sometimes you may be, especially like this morning here in a church service, a lot of believers around. You cannot overemphasize the importance of every single solitary New Testament local church believer that is in an assembly. You can't over overemphasize how important that is. When brethren dwell together in unity, Psalm 133, when brethren dwell together in unity, how, pleasure, how pleasant it is, how perfect it is, how pure it is, how wonderful it is. When brethren dwell together in unity. It's only three verses. We'll read the whole psalm. Look at the next verse. It's like the precious ointment upon the head. This is the anointing oil poured on uh, like, like David when he was anointed priest. You know, we anoint with oil. You know, we, 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 we take a little oil and, 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 you know, we dab a little bit on our finger and, and we put it on a person's forehead or we put it on the back of their hand or if their elbow is hurt, we tell them to roll their sleeve up and we put it on their, on their elbow. They didn't do that. They had a horn of oil. Now, do we have still have that horn in there somewhere? It's like this big cow's horn that you're blowing. It's a big thing. I mean, this wouldn't even hardly fill the end of it. And they would take that horn of oil, and they would open the, the, the large end, and then they would just dump it on this person. Want to try? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're like, we're like two gallons, you know, just bloom, 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 bloom. And, and it says here, it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of the garment. I mean, like all the way down to just, just running all the way. See, there, there, there's a lesson there for us. Go back to verse one. When brethren dwell together in unity... It's like 
It's, it's like what? See, see, this is the Holy Spirit. And it says right there, say, well, pastor, I don't do it much in the church, you know, and I feel kind of like an outsider, and I feel like I'm kind of like out on the edge. Nobody hardly knows me, and, and, and I don't have any, you know, position of responsibility. Well, we can fix that. <laughs> Go to the Ministry of Help Support Center right over there right after service and get yourself signed up. We'll, put you to, we'll give you something to do. Put your hand to, and you can feel the part. But see, that verse right there, verse 2, you know what that says? The same anointing that comes on the head flows all the way down to every other square inch of the entire body. The whole body is covered. When the whole body is gathered together in unity, the whole body is covered with the anointing. Look at the third verse. It's like the dew coming down on Mount Hermon as the dew descends on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. This is one of my favorite verses of all time that commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. He didn't permit the blessing. He didn't make the blessing available. He commands the blessing. That, that church down there, that, that church, that group of believers, that group of my disciples, they're, they're unified. They've got one purpose, one heart, one mind. I command that there be blessing on that place. And every member of that body is going to get anointed. The commanded blessing of God. <coughs> I love that verse. I love that verse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It's not supposed to just be one person anointed in a service. Everybody's anointed for whatever they're going to do in that particular service. And everybody gets the benefit uh, of, man, praise and worship was so good. I just sensed the presence of the Lord. It was so so close. I mean, I just just, like he had his arm around my shoulder. And we were worshiping together. Then I go to work on Monday. Listen, that doesn't mean he left you. No, he's still there. He's still with you. He's still on you. He's still in you. And, and, and uh, uh, you, you just don't, don't have the tangible presence, the manifested presence, but that doesn't mean he's not present. He doesn't leave you and then come back. In 1 Kings chapter 18, at the end of the chapter, Elijah takes off off Mount Carmel, runs down the mountain and across the plains of Jezreel, about 22 miles. And the the last thing it says is, and the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he outran the king's chariot. The king's, you know, like the Mercedes, what do you call that car that goes over 200 miles? I mean, this thing, these are the best chariot around. Best wheels, best gold, best horses. And there's Elijah. And it almost almost looks to us like he took a side route. He didn't even take the most direct route. He just, took a, he just took a side route because the Bible said, and when the king came through the gate, it, there was Elijah. And he didn't get translated. He outran him because the hand of the Lord came upon him. What happened the next day? The next day, old Queen Jezebel put out a death warrant and, and, and put a contract out on him and was going to take his head off. And so he got up and he took off running again. He didn't even get to the edge of town. And he was wore out, and he collapsed, crawled under the juniper tree and hid there and said, Lord, just kill me. The Lord said, well, if you want to die, just hang around. Jezebel promised to do that. I don't have to kill you. God's not in the killing business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, the hand of the Lord was on him one day. The hand of the Lord wasn't on him that day. The Lord will never anoint you to run in fear. So you're not an Old Testament believer. This isn't the Old Covenant. The Spirit of God is with you. The Spirit of God is in you. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And he doesn't come in and move out and come in and move out and come in and move out. He just stays. I love the consistency of the Lord, don't you? He just moves in and he sticks around. Well, that's one of the things that the Lord Jesus says right here. He says in the last words here in the gospel of Matthew, verse 18, all power and authority. Now, both words are used there in different scriptures, say all authority, some all power, and some say all power and authority. Those are two different things. Friday night, I was doing a ride with the La Crosse Police Department. And we responded to a car accident. 
and, and very fortunate there, there weren't some fatalities there. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy that, that both the driver of the pickup and the driver of the car and her three children were all gonna be okay. And, and, and we pulled up and, and, I, and I asked the officer, what do you want me to do? He said, well, let's get out and see what's going on. And, <clears throat> and, and so we got out and there was already help there and more help was arriving. But one of the police cars, can I just help you with something? Yeah. When there's a car behind you and it's got like a siren going, it's got red lights and blue lights and white flashing lights. And, and when that's behind you, pull over. It's amazing. People don't know that, really? Yeah. Pull over and stop. And so instead of doing that, we had to go in the wrong lane and go, go right facing traffic, trying to get down there to help people who were hurt. <clears throat> then when we got there, there was a civilian service employee. He's got red lights and blue lights in his little truck, and he can't get through because nobody will let him through because that would mean they'd have to wait. How much does a normal car weigh? Mike, what's a car weigh? 1,500 pounds? 2,500? Man, you guys got some big cars, a 3,000, 1,500. All right, let's, 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 a ton, a ton. I don't weigh a ton. And if I did, it would just be even head on, like, you know, two rams. And I would stand there because I would have the power to stop that car. I have the power to stop any car. I don't have the power to stop a car going 35 miles an hour. But when I put that badge on, I can step right out in front of that car and put one hand up just like this and look very sternly at the driver, and she's going to come to a stop. And she did, because I have the authority. I have the authority vested in me by this city and its chief of police, and I could stop the car so that the person who can come down, come park his vehicle, come out and take up traffic, and he just come over and shook his head and said, isn't it amazing? I said, no, that's not the word I would use, but, <laughs> but <clears throat> so just, just so, so you understand the difference between having the power to do something and having the authority to do something? I didn't have the power to stop that car. Now, if I was a cement truck full, I'd have just pulled over in that lane and park. <laughs> I had the power, but I wasn't. I was just a human being with a vest, with a, a reflective vest and, and, and a badge, and just stopped the car, just stopped traffic, and then just wave traffic, and then stop traffic again, and wave traffic from the other direction until other help arrived and got that done. You've served as law enforcement. That's the way it's done. Do you have the power to stop a semi? But when you were sworn officer, did you have the authority to stop it? Sure did. But this verse says that the Lord Jesus Christ has both. The power and the authority. The power and the authority. All power and authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. What are the next three words? Go ye therefore. Listen, I'm authorized, I whooped heaven, I, excuse me, I whooped hell, I whooped death, I whooped the grave, I made an open show of my enemies, all power and authority is given unto me, I now authorize you. You are now authorized by the one who in heaven has all power, not half, not most, not some, all power in heaven and in earth is given to him, therefore go in his name. And that's what Mark said, go, go in my name. So he says, you go therefore. And then he uses this, this, this and I need somebody who can read again. Come on, Roger, I picked on you last time. But, but uh, <clears throat> he uses this word, go ye therefore. Now look up at the King James, go ye therefore, and what? What's the next word? Teach. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. I'll just keep on reading. And then the next verse, and, and we were sharing about that just a moment ago. Teaching them to observe how many things? All. all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. always, even to the end of the world or end of the age. So he's not going to leave you or forsake you. So let's go back up to verse 19. Go ye therefore, and you see the, the designation there on the word teach. What does the margin there say that means? Teach. 
Make disciples of. Louder. Make disciples of. Make disciples. Thank you. Make disciples of. Now, I was recently asked and, 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 and said, yeah, I'll do that in a service. Um, I was recently asked about witnessing to people and sharing the good news with people and praying with people to receive Christ. And I made a bold statement that I won't flinch from, that nowhere in the Bible do you have the vernacular given that we use in modern day Christianity to ask Jesus to come into your heart. You can't find that anywhere in the Bible. We've adopted that. I say we, I mean a whole Christendom, the whole body of Christ. Nowhere in the Bible does it say anything about having people pray a prayer and ask Jesus into their heart. This is one of the greatest calamities in our lifetime. One of the greatest, and it, it borders on catastrophes of our lifetime that, that the body of Christ primarily in America, and the reason I pick on us is I'm not picking on us, but America fulfills about 80 to 85% of all of the evangelism of the rest of the world. Over 80% of all missionaries come from America. Now you put the, you put the, you, you, you crank the vice down and put the pressure on, on our economy and our finances, that's, that's usually what suffers. You let <clears throat> the demonic powers that be eradicate and erase our freedoms, our constitution. You bring something in like socialism or communism and take away the liberties that we have, all of that will be eradicated. All of that financing of missions work and evangelism throughout the work. See, see, a lot of you think your personal freedoms are the target. They got nothing to do with the target. The target is the spreading of the gospel throughout the world through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll say it again, the United States of America sends about 80 to 85% of all missionaries throughout the rest of the world. That's where, that's where the missions work is financed by. Millions of missionaries serve everywhere, financed by money that comes from this country. Not from the places that they go. They go there and they, they, they are supported there by money that comes from here. And so they're told, they're told the same thing that you and I are told, and that is to preach the gospel, to proclaim the good news. And somehow, somewhere in the neighborhood of under 100 years ago, somehow it got to be popular to just have a service and then invite people down to the front to pray a prayer. And that's how personal evangelism has been taught. You can either do cold calls and go knock on doors. You can have friendship evangelism. You can have Bible clutches and Bible studies. You can have an evangelistic thrust. You can go out street witnessing. You can do anything you want. And you can give them a, give them, maybe give them a track. And maybe they'll pray that prayer one time on their own. Maybe they can come to a church service and have an altar call at the end. They'll pray a prayer. Maybe they'll shed a tear or two. They'll get up. They'll go their way. And nothing else will change. But somebody will tell them, because you prayed that one sinner's prayer, now you're going to go to heaven. You find nothing like that in the Bible. Oh, it may have just a, a, a remnant of some of those, some of those uh, details, but nowhere in the Bible do you ever find one single person praying one single prayer and then telling, telling them, okay, that was it. You're good to go now. You're set. Everything is okay. You can go back to living the life you once lived. You can go back to the same relationships. You can go back to the same practices. You can go back to the same habits. You can go back to all the same friends. You don't find that in the Bible. You find in the Bible, if you go submit your life and yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior and confess him as Lord, everything changes. Everything changes. There are places you don't go back to. There are people you don't go back to. There are practices you don't go back to. Everything changes. 
I, I, I've got a good friend. Um, his first name is Ronnie, uh, and uh, he's a bishop in, in his denomination. Uh, he doesn't pastor a church anymore. He goes to churches uh, all over his part of the country, uh, which is northeastern Illinois and Indiana and Ohio and southern Michigan and southern our state. And, and <clears throat> he, uh, he, he goes, and, and I mean, that man is a preacher. He is a preaching machine. And, and uh, about that tall, skin quite a bit darker than mine, uh, and, and uh, jet black hair, you know, afro. Uh, and, and, and I mean, Ronnie White can absolutely, that's his name, Ronnie White. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, he just absolutely preaches the word. And when he gets done, and he'll call me once in a while, he'll text me once in a while, preach at thus and such a church, and, and at the end, 16 people responded to the altar call to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's a, there, there's a chasm of difference between people responded and got saved or people responded to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ never walked through the planet and said, pray this prayer and you'll be good. Never. He said, leave everything and come follow me. That's, that's, that's the Savior that we serve. The Bible that you read and that I preach from states, your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. That's what redemption means. Redemption doesn't mean your past is all cleared away and you're never going to have to answer for any of your sins. You're good to go from now on. Redemption means you have been bought with a price. You now belong to him. Leave that tax collecting booth. Leave your business. Leave your fishing nets. Come and follow me. That's Bible vernacular. This verse does not say get people saved. This verse says make disciples out of them. Well, how do you do that? By teaching. By teaching. Notice what the next thing says. Notice what the next thing says. How many, how many people do we hand tracts to and say, pray with me, accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and then our church does water baptisms on Sunday night. I'll be expecting you there so then you can get baptized. And from that point on, you can start being taught and mentored and instructed, and you can become part of our church congregation, and you can start growing. And after three, four years of growing, uh, then you can start serving. And that's the plan of God for your life. But it's not. I think it's a travesty that it's been propagated throughout Christendom that all you have to do is walk up and say a sinner's prayer and then, and then you're going to go to heaven and everything's going to be good. That may very well be why Jesus said there are going to be a lot of people there that come and say, but I called you, Lord. I, I even did some stuff for you. And he said, but I never knew you. A lot of that, a lot of that witnessing and a lot of that presentation ought to be, I want to present you with a doorway into a brand new life. Not just say a prayer, feel better, and then, and then just have this momentary, momentary uh, moment with the Lord. He wants you to have a life. Amen. He wants you to have a life with him. Now, you all know this, so I'm presenting this more to you as a, as a answer to the question, well, if we've been witnessing wrong to people, how do we witness right to people? The Lord wants your life. He wants your time. He wants your energy. He wants your focus. He wants your worship. He wants your heart. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, not, not just one little, one little segment and slice and piece of my life. But again, it's been promoted and it's been practiced in America and then around the world. Hey, we got 250 people saved last night. Okay, how many of them got baptized? How many of them are learning? How many of them are being discipled? How many of them are growing? How many of them are coming to church? How many of them are active? How many of them are, uh, are, are now serving? Well, we got 250 saved. Did you? Did you really? See, Jesus went on to say there in the seventh chapter of Matthew, he went on to say, <clears throat> by their fruits, you'll know them. By their productivity, you'll know them. Billy Graham. Anybody ever heard of Billy Graham? Anybody over here, lift your hand if you've ever heard of Billy Graham. Okay, middle section, anybody over here? Any, you've ever heard of Billy Graham? What, 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 what did he do? He was an evangelist. What's, what do evangelists do? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Billy Graham stated, Billy Graham, 
that we have surveyed and we have studied and we have come to the conclusion that over 95%, 94 point some odd percent in all of their studies, almost 95% of the people that come forward in our crusades, remember how many it was, over 100 million, over 95% of them never go on and have a fruitful Christian life, never become part of a local church never go on and have any type of interactive relationship with God. Well-meaning people brought them, and they went and they prayed a prayer. They, they, they got some literature. They went, and nothing changed. So who am I to say, yes, they got saved? Who am I to put their name on a list and say, yep, they were born again. I can't. I, how could I tell that when I can't see inside of their heart? Neither can you. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, only one who can do that is Jesus. 94.7, almost 95%, they, 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 they never go on and have a fruitful, productive Christian life. Billy Graham said that. Now, how do I know he said it? Because he had a crusade planned in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I was a young pastor, young minister. I was excited. Billy Graham, Billy Graham, coming to La Crosse. I mean, come on. He's going to come to La Crosse. Anybody remember that he, when he came? Does anybody remember when Billy Graham was in La Crosse and had a crusade? No, you wouldn't remember it because he didn't come. He didn't come. You know why he didn't come? Because there couldn't get together enough local churches to put their own agendas aside <clears throat> their own plans aside, their own programs aside, and say, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get together with others and, 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 and we'll cooperate. Couldn't get enough local churches. And Billy Graham said, I will not go to cities or towns any longer and hold a crusade unless I can get the majority of Christian churches on board cooperating together to open their doors and take care of all the new babies that are born in our crusades. If you can't get over 50% of your churches who are Christian churches together, I'm not coming. And he didn't, because we couldn't. We've got places to go, things to do, people to see, our own agenda, our own plan. We've got our own program. That doesn't fit in it. We want to see this happen. We want to see some of the offerings split up so we get some of it. We want, a full, we want this. We want that. We want the other. And they couldn't get enough churches together. So he canceled. So he canceled. Tried it again with one of his associates, John Wesley White, one of his preaching associates. Had that all booked. Barely scraped together 51% of the churches, and then a couple of them balked. So he didn't come. That's the story of the city you're sitting in right now. No, no, a lot of things I could say about that. I'm going to reserve. I'm just going to say, possibly the greatest evangelist that ever walked the planet, at least during our lifetime, saw in his later years the value of discipling converts. This verse does not say go into all the world and make converts. It says go into all the world and make disciples. Go make disciples out of them. It's fine to share Christ and the plan of salvation, but that's just the doorway. Remember, if you pray with someone to accept Christ, they get born. What do you do with babies? Kenneth E. Hagin went to a city, and he did an evangelistic crusade, which was kind of odd for him. He was mostly a teacher. And he went into that city, and he did the same thing. He got all the churches together, and he, and, 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 and he chastised them. He corrected them. He said, just had the big evangelistic crusade. He got all these people born again. He got all these names on slips, and they filled them out and gave you a record of it. How many of them did your church follow up on? Now listen real carefully. How many of them did your church follow up on? He said the predominant answer was always the same. Well, we just figured if they got anything, they'd come back. We figured if they got anything, they'd be back. 
He said, <clears throat> the Bible says that's the day they're born. The Bible says in 1 Peter, as newborn babes in Christ, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. How many of you, if you had a baby born in your congregation, would have something to say to the parents if they just left the hospital? You know, just left the baby there. And the staff just picked up the baby and took the baby out to the sidewalk and just laid the baby down on the sidewalk and left the baby there. How many of you have something to say about that? Any of you moms can take, take a little bit? Dads? Yeah. He said, that's what you're doing with these new believers. They just became a brand new believer. They just got born again. They don't know anything. You need to teach them. You need to pick them up. You need to carry them for a while. Why do we expect people who just prayed to receive Christ three weeks ago, we expect now they know how to walk by faith. They don't even know how to walk. They don't even know how to crawl. You ought to still be carrying them. And then they do one thing wrong. They get some little, some little slip. They say, dang it. And oh man, you're ready to cross them off. They never got saved. They're not. How dare them talk like that in the house of God? They don't know how to talk yet. You got to change their diapers. Dirty diapers stink. I don't care who you are. Your diaper stunk. Yeah, when, when people make a mess, it's messy. And you got to pick them up and clean them up and brush them off and, and, and wash them with the water of the word. They feel so terrible. They lost their temper. They, 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 they blew it. You know, they smoked again. They drank again. They cussed again. They, you know, they, they feel so bad. It's, it's you that puts your arm around them and, and stands them back up and says, no, it's okay. We're not going to give up on you. God's not going to give up on you. Now, if you still have to do that after 30, 40, 50 years of a person being a Christian, they need to grow up. They need to grow up. In him, in all things, Ephesians chapter 4. But see, Jesus, you can't find a verse that says, go into all the world and make converts. Can't do it, can you? Let's look at a couple verses before we go. You ready? Yes. Turn back to the, uh, to the book of Acts. To the book of Acts. Now, here are some of the, some of the great, uh, great examples in our Bible about people being saved. Aren't you, aren't you glad? That there are some, glory to God. Here's the, here's the Philippian jail, Acts 16. Acts 16, the Philippian jail. And, and, and of course, the, the Lord opens the, the, the windows and the bars and, and out they run and, 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 and everybody's, uh, everybody's free. And, and the jailer, you remember that story? I don't have to read it all, right? Okay, the, the imprisonment at Philippi, and then, and then the, uh, uh, the midnight, verse 25, singing praises to God and praying, and then the great earthquake. And verse 27, the keeper of the prison woke up from sleep, saw the prison doors open, and drew his sword, going to kill himself, supposing all the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do yourself no harm, we're all here. He, calling for light, sprang in and trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas. And brought them out and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, pray the sinner's prayer and you're good to go. No? Well, let's see. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your house. <coughs> I've heard people say all he did because he was the head of the house as long as he believed everybody else was covered. Well, that can't be right because the next verse says he went and spoke the word to all of them. No, they all had to believe themselves. He opened the door to his family, but it was still up to each one of them. You shall be saved and your house. And he spoke the word of, God, word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. He spoke, to, he spoke to him the word of the Lord and they spoke to him the word of the Lord. Now listen, verse 31, they weren't done yet. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your house. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. Have you ever seen that? Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who was in his house. And he took them the same hour of night, washed their stripes. And then what happened? He was what? He was 
baptized. He was baptized. So uh, this man believed and was baptized. In Acts chapter 19, the believers that, that, that Paul came to, he asked them what you believed, and they said, John's baptism. Well, that's not the gospel, is it? That was a John the Baptist went around, he baptized people. But Paul specified to them in verse 4, he baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying people should believe on him that would later come, and that was Jesus. Once they heard this, they were baptized in his name. And so they believed on Jesus, and then they were what? See, that's the first step after conversion. We don't stress it much. We often say, well, baptism is not a condition of salvation. No, it's not. It's just commanded as the first step after salvation. Yeah, it, it, it's, no, the thief on the cross didn't get baptized. No, he was a thief on the cross. Look around. Do you see any? There's nobody around you nailed to a cross. Walk up and down the streets. Go stand outside of the theater. Go, go to a restaurant. See if you see anybody nailed to a cross. Well, then that doesn't apply to you. They can believe and then get baptized and then go on and be discipled. And that's what happened to these people. Notice as well in chapter 19, that uh, it says in verse 6, and when Paul then laid his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came upon them. So we have something else added right, right in there, and that's it. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, if you go back to uh, uh, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, here's, here's Philip. Remember Philip in the Ethiopian? He's riding along in a chariot, and the Spirit, verse 29, said to, to Philip, go join yourself to the chariot. He ran after it, and he was reading the book of Isaiah. He said, do you understand? And the man said, how can I except someone guide me? And so Philip jumped in, and the place he was reading was uh, chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. And, and he asked Philip about it. And verse 35 says, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. Now, what does that mean, preach to him Jesus? What does that mean? We're not sure what he said, but as they went their way, they came to water, and the eunuch said, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, obviously, something he said to him was about water baptism. Now, most people wouldn't, wouldn't qualify preaching Jesus as, as, as that being part of their message, would they? But he preached to him, Jesus, and, and as soon as they came to water, the man said, hey, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Peter said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So they commanded the chariot to stop, and they went down in the water, and he baptized him. And he baptized him. Well, if you look at, at, at Philip's ministry over in the earlier part of that chapter, Philip went down, verse 5, to the city of Mary, and he preached Christ to them. And there were miracles and healings. And verse 12, they believed Philip's preaching. Oh, what's it say at the end of that verse? Look at that. And they were baptized. And they were baptized. See, praying the sinner's prayer is not the end of all things. It's just the very beginning. There are steps after that to becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ, a, 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 a child of God. Not just a baby of God, a child of God. And we sing that song, I am a child of God. I never heard anybody sing, I'm a baby of God. <laughs> well, if you, if you were a, a baby once, you have to grow some before you become a child. Before you can ever say, I'm a man of God or a woman of God. No, they were baptized. And then, verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. When they came down, they prayed for him that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, but they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. That's what we just read in chapter 19, didn't we? I said that's what we read in 19, didn't we? Yes, sir. Yeah, we did. We, we go over to chapter 9. We go over to chapter 9. We have, to, we have to skip over chapter 9. That's Paul and his conversion. He didn't just pray a sinner's prayer. He took years growing in the Bible after he was baptized. In chapter 10, we have Cornelius' household, and we have them receiving, uh, at the end of that chapter, we have them receiving the Holy Spirit. He fell on them. And then, verse 47, Peter says, 
How can we forbid water to these that they wouldn't, shouldn't be baptized? They were already received the Holy Ghost and commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. If we go on into chapter 11, we read there of the, Christian, of the believers at Antioch, and it says that, that, that others preached the word, and, and uh, the people at Antioch, in verse 20, they, they received the preaching of the Lord Jesus. Well, that was enough. It's over. You're guaranteed heaven now. You received the preaching of the Lord Jesus, right? And that's not what they believed. It says in verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. A great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then tidings of those things came to the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas <coughs> that he should go to Antioch. When he came, he saw the grace of God and was glad, and he exhorted them that with purpose of heart they should cleave to the Lord. You see the two different phrases there? First they turned to the Lord in verse 21, and now the preacher comes and he preaches they'll stay close to him. Cleave to the Lord. Stay hooked up to him. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to seek Saul. When he found him, brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught many people. Now, what do they call people that are born again and that have turned to the Lord and are now cleaving to the Lord and who are taught God's word? What do we call those people? Disciples. Thank you. It goes on, says, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The disciples, they had been born a year earlier, they'd been saved, and now they've been taught for a whole year. And in other places, it says they had church every day, except Sunday, then they had twice. Had eight services a week, and they were taught for 365 days. Somebody do the math for me real quick. It's about 2,500 services that they had, and after that, they were finally called Christians. They were disciples, and they were finally called Christ-like after about 2,500 services. Christ-like. Christ-like. Christians. The disciples. How do you become a disciple? John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus doesn't want us to lead people to a sinner's prayer and then go off and never see them again. Now, now if that's the only contact you ever have with them, it's better than nothing. But it ought to at least be an urging, according to our Bible, that that's followed with water baptism, which is the first step after you're born again, after you're saved. It doesn't come as a, as a condition of salvation. No, 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 a thousand times no. No, it's not a condition of salvation. It's the first step after salvation into discipleship and following and learning and growing in your faith and in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, go make them everywhere. Now... I thought it said 8.15, and we were just about ready to start church. But <clears throat> turn, turn, turn. I'm, I'm a, I, now I, now, I, now I, all my time's gone, but I have only got through Matthew. So turn over to Mark really quick. Mark, the last words of Jesus, the great commission of Jesus, as recorded by, the, by the, the, the writer here in Mark chapter 16. He says in verse 15, <coughs> Go into the world and preach the gospel. <coughs> What's the gospel? You don't have to go to hell. You can have a relationship with the Lord. You can walk with him. You can know him. You, you, you can serve him. You can worship him. You can love him. You can experience his great glorious love, his provision. You, you can be right with God. Not just you can pray this prayer and be gone. Everything in your life be the same, but you'll go to heaven when you die. No, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, and, and isn't it interesting, the next thing he said? And he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism is that next step. It's that, it's that progression of that decision. You, yeah, you make a decision, and yes, you, you respond, and you walk down the aisle, and you pray that prayer, but that's just the very first, that's not even the first step. That's like half a step. I mean, you're a human. Look down. You still have two legs? All right. Then, then you, you take one step with this foot, and then you just take another step with that foot? No, that's called hopping. That's not called walking. I mean, your step is measured with two paces. 
I mean, you, you believe and are baptized, and, and, and that's just like the first step. And then from then on, you start growing. Then on you being a disciple. Then you ought to be in a church. Jesus gave the parable of the Last Supper, and he told us, we, the Christians, go out and compel them to go in, come in so that what? So that my house will be full. He wasn't upset that people didn't believe in him. He wasn't upset that people didn't receive him. He was upset they didn't come to his house and that there were still empty seats. He said, go out in the highways and hedges. Go out in the highways and hedges. That, do you remember this parable? Yeah, you do? Okay. Yeah, Book of Luke. He wasn't upset that they didn't believe in him. It said, and he was angry because they hadn't come. They hadn't come to his house. They hadn't come to the assembly. That's part of becoming a disciple and a follower and a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, one who walks with him, one who worships him, one who honors him, one who obeys him, and one who serves him. That's the plan of God for you. And it's the plan of God for any and everyone else that you witness to. There aren't two categories of people. You look around your church and see people that love the Lord and people that serve him and people that worship him and people that honor him, people that pray to him, people that love him with all their heart. And then there's those people that just pray once and you never see again. And those are kind of like two different groups. There's only one group. There's only one family of God. And he expects the same out of everybody that you share your faith with that he does with you and me. Yes, he does. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. And then there ought to be signs following them. What signs are following them that believe? What signs are following them? They prayed one time and they went away and that was in 1967 and, and they still believe they're going to heaven? I don't know if they are or not. I can't give them that guarantee. There ought to be some signs following them. Jesus said, by their fruits, you'll know them. What kind of fruits? Fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, temperance. Jesus looked around and said, I never see him in my house. That's what Jesus said. Here, he said, these signs will follow those that believe. They'll cast out devils. Wow. Probably got to go to church more than one service before you learn how to cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll pick up serpents and drink deadly things and not be hurt. They'll lay hands on the sick. And they'll recover. Look, book, book of Luke, verse 24, chapter 24, verse 44. Luke 24. Get anything out of church this morning? Yeah. Anything whatsoever. Luke chapter 24, the last words out of Jesus' mouth. Verse 44, these are the words I spoke to you while I was yet with you that must be fulfilled, which are written in the law and Moses and prophets and Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And so their commission to go witness had to do with Christ coming, his suffering, his dying, his being resurrected, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. So repentance looks like part of what they were commissioned to preach. Remission of sins was part of what they were commissioned to preach. And you are my witnesses of these things. And then what's the next word in your Bible? What is it? And, and. so he's not done yet. So he says, and behold, I send the promise of my father upon you and wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Amen. Acts chapter one, who is also, which is also written by Luke, it starts at the very same place. This is the baptism or infilling with the Holy Spirit. Now, you listen to some people. I wouldn't recommend it. I used to. I used to be a part of part of their circle. And I used to say the same thing that they said, because that's what I heard. And you know, you tend to believe what you hear. Matter of fact, <clears throat> will you give me two minutes? Just take a little side issue right here, a little side journey right here. I, 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 I spoke to a parent of a local Christian school this week. 
And my assessment of what they told me was, well, here's my assessment. That person who propagated this at your Christian school's chapel service, that person's probably well-meaning, but my guess is all they're doing is just repeating what they've heard. We are all such victims of that. Because what they were telling these students is not found in the pages of the Holy Writ, the Book of God, the B-I-B-L-E, the eternal scriptures do not contain any such doctrine that there are big sins and little sins. Significant sins like murder and insignificant sins that really aren't so bad. And had a scripture that some people have a log in their eye and some people only a splinter. So apparently the splinter isn't quite so bad, except it still doesn't address my question. Whether it's big or whether it's little, the verse that says the result of it is death doesn't distinguish. It just says the wages of sin. Now maybe you think that you're going to be the one to draw the line down the list and tell me which is big and which is little. Because I can't find in the pages of scripture where anyone is authorized to define big from little, can you? Uh, I'm sure it's not in the pastoral verses because I've read all of them. I spend time continuously submitting my life to them and making sure I'm serving in that capacity which I'm called to in accordance with the instruction book. So I know it's not my duty. Maybe it's the parental responsibility. Maybe it's parents. Maybe that's your responsibility to tell your kids which is a little sin and which is a big sin. Because obviously if it's a big sin, you ought to avoid it, but little sins is no big deal. And so what you're doing is you're training up a bunch of kids at a Christian school, a bunch of junior hires, elementary school students, and high schoolers to think that if they blow it just a little, they can brush it off. It's no big deal with God. And you can do things that you know to be sin, forbidden in the scriptures by the living God himself that will ultimately curse your life. But because I teach you in chapel, I can tell you there's big sins and little sins and the little sins are no big deal to God. Show me even one sin. Now you think you've got a verse, but the Bible says in the mouth of two or three, so go ahead and take the one you want. Show me two or three more. There isn't one. There's no such thing as big sins and little sins. It's just sin. Sin is whatever's not right in God's sight. Righteousness is right in God's sight. There's no such thing as big and little. I've got a relative who thinks that there's, there's such a thing as a little lie. Who Here, right, here I go again. <clears throat> you got me going here. So here I go again. Who, who is the one who, who gives you the definition of what's a little lie and what's, you say, well, that was just a little lie. What's a little lie? Who gets to make the choice over what's little and what's big? Who is authorized to make that determination for your children and to tell them what's right, what's wrong, or what's a little right and what's a little wrong? And as long as it doesn't cross this line, it's not a big sin, it's just a little sin, nothing for you to worry about. Who makes that? Who makes that choice? Do you? Do the elders? Do the deacons? Does everyone just... See, ultimately, here's what happens. The last verse of the book of Judges says, since there was no leader, everyone did that which was right in their own sight. That's humanism. That, 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 that's not Christianity. Christianity, there's one who makes the decision for all of us, every single solitary human being, every single solitary angelic entity, everyone's determination and decision is made by one, and his, he's the ever-living God, and he says, this is right, this is wrong, there is no gray, there's nothing in between. If the Bible forbids it, don't let anybody ever tell you, well, that's a little one. What, lying, cheating, and stealing are little ones? Murder, brutalizing, assault and battery, adultery, those are the big ones. Idol worship, well, yeah, but if it's just a little idol. 
I mean, idol worship, I mean, that's it. like if it's this big stone thing that falls over and its head falls off called Dagon. But my idol is just a little bitty idol. Are any of you as confused as I am about this issue? I'm not confused about it at all. No, people say what they hear other people say. They get together with this group of believers. They have no leader. They come to this made-up conclusion, and it's not supported in the Scriptures anywhere. And, of course, that is what happens when Scripture is not the ultimate authority in any person or group of people's lives. That's exactly what happens. Now, where was I when I got off on all this? Luke 24. Luke 24. <clears throat> and it says, I'll send the promise of the Father. This is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's where Acts chapter 1 starts. Acts chapter 1 starts the exact same place that Luke chapter 24 ends. And in Acts chapter 1, what does he say? He says, wait for the promise of the Father. That's the first words out of Jesus' mouth in Acts chapter 1. Verse 4, first words in red. Wait for the promise of the Father. John baptized in water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, you, now you, still, you still got a minute or two for me? Okay, read over to chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, that was seven days later, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one place. Oh, oh, I went too far already. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, help me preach, they were, no, 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 louder. They were all with one place, in one accord, in one place. They were all with one accord, in one place, one accord, all with one accord, in one place, and suddenly... I love the suddenlies of the Bible. There came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared to them cloven tongues like fire and sat upon, wait, 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 help me preach, and sat upon. So they were all there, and they, they landed on each one of them. And verse 4, and they were, help me preach, and they were louder, and they were outside voice, please, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I didn't used to believe that. Because the people that I ran with and hung with and the people in my youth group and, and the people in my church, I didn't believe that because they didn't believe that. And so I just believed what they believed. Oh, yeah, Pastor, I remember Acts 17, verse 11. And they all received with all readiness of mind the teaching of the Holy Scriptures and it didn't matter what the Holy Scripture said. They just believed what everybody else believed. <laughs> no, no, they were open to receive the word of God with all readiness of mind. And they searched the Bible for themselves to see that those things are so. That's why that verse is so powerfully important to me. You read your Bible and see what it says for yourself. You don't listen to any woman's conference speaker, any man conference speaker, your pastor included, any evangelist, any, any website, any internet preacher, any place you visit, any conference speaker. You don't listen to them. You listen to your Bible. Your Bible can't be wrong. Your Bible is the word of truth. Read it. Study it. Believe it. Meditate on it. Live it. You'll be judged according to it. You'll be judged according to it. A personal uh, man I have personal acquaintance with, Howard Pittman, just went to heaven last year uh, at 99 years old. Howard Pittman had a main artery trunk burst uh, while he was on his way down. He was a Baptist preacher, and he was on his way down to run for sheriff. He was on his way down to file papers in his home state of Mississippi, and he pulled over the side of the road, and he bled to death. And his, his spirit left his body, and he ascended up, up into the heavenlies. And he had audience with the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to send you back, and you're going to preach for me. And you're not just going to preach this gospel of salvation that you think, because you're going to cast out devils, and you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you're going to, you're going to speak with other tongues and pray in a heavenly language, and you're going to be empowered, and you're going to need my power for everything I've, I've got for you to do. And this, your, your journey is not over, and your ministry is not over, and you haven't, you haven't haven't fully done what I've called you to do, so go back and do it. And you know what he did? He argued with the Lord. He said, to, he, he said I, just, I was there. I was the same person I am here. I just didn't have a body. And I stood there and I said, Lord, I said, Lord, 
uh, my church doesn't believe those things. He said, Lord, Lord, my church doesn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My church doesn't believe in praying in a heavenly prayer language. My church doesn't believe in casting out devils. Matter of fact, my church doesn't even believe there are devils. He said the Lord Jesus Christ in the most authoritative voice he had ever heard, didn't even know that, that the Lord Almighty had a voice like that, said, I don't care what your church believes. You'll not be judged according to what your church believes. You'll be judged by what my word says. And that's the only thing that I care whether or not you believe. Now, you get down there and you read it and you study it and you meditate on it and you do what it says, not what your church says. I don't care what your church believes. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to judge you according to the word of God. Not what you believe, not what your family believes, not what your friends believe, not what your Bible study believes, not what your former church believes, not what your pastor believes. He's going to judge you according to what the word of God says. That's what you're going to be judged by. It's the only standard, folks. It's the only standard that there is. And he's the one who breathed every single verse of it. And that's what you and I will be judged by. No, I didn't believe what the Bible says. I believed that the baptism in the Holy Spirit was for certain ones because that's, that's what my people believe. Well, it's for a few, but it's not for everybody. I can't find that in the Bible. I can't find it in Acts chapter 2, in John chapter 14, when Jesus talked about it in John chapter 7, when, when we see it in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. I can't find one place, not even one I mean, if there was one, maybe I'd twist it and make it say what I wanted it to say. But I can't even find one place where it doesn't say that everybody there, everybody, even Cornelius' household, they didn't even know there was such a thing. Acts chapter 19, they said, what were you baptized into? He said, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you were baptized? They said, we've never even heard of the Holy Ghost. But every single solitary time, they were all filled. And Jesus never, ever, ever, say it, never, ever, ever, never, say it, never, ever, ever, never, ever, never, ever, 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 not even one time did he say there's two distinct groups of believers in the Bible, or is in the church, and, and they're, they're articulated in the Bible. There's two distinct groups of people, those who will be filled and those who don't want to be filled, those who it is my will to be filled with the Holy Spirit and those who it's not my will to be filled. That, that's a, that's a man-made doctrine. That's a lie. Until I embraced that it was God's will to fill everyone with his spirit, I wasn't filled. But then all of a sudden, one day, one day, one day, I just, I just embraced what the Bible said, that it's for everybody. Then I was a candidate. Until then, the devil said, no, you're part of group B. No, 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 that, it's not for everybody. You're, 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 you're so, see, I, I believe that same thing about prosperity. Oh, God wants some people to prosper. Where did I find that in the Bible? I didn't. I just heard people say it. People around me said it. People who love the Lord said it. Well, it's not God's will for everybody to prosper, so I stayed poor, impoverished. Didn't have anything. Didn't have enough. Went farther in debt every single month, didn't we? Loved each other, loved the Lord, and every month we went farther into debt until I just said, no, God, what God provides for one, he provides for all. The Bible name for that doctrine is he's no respecter of persons. And what he'll do for one, he'll do for you. If, if he'll save me, he'll save you. If he'll save you, he'll save me. If he fills you, he'll fill me. If he, if he, if he fills me, he'll fill you. And if he supplies for me, he'll supply for you. And if he supplies for you, he'll supply for me. And if he loves you, he loves me. And if he loves me, he loves you. And if he's got a place prepared for you, he's got a place prepared for me. And if he's got a place prepared for me, then I can go ahead and do whatever's necessary to get to that place. Now, it doesn't say everything he does for you. It says everything he made available for you. The doing part might have some, some other criteria to it. John chapter 21, just a page to the left of where you're at right now. Say, Pastor... This service is going long. Oh, not near long enough. Ready? Ready? Here's the last thing Jesus said in the Gospel of John. I said, are you ready? Yeah. Raise a hand if you're ready. You want to hear it. You want to go to lunch. Um, what's the last thing that Jesus said? You follow me. 
you follow me. See, I have to make assessment to some of these things, you know, and, and, and some of these false doctrines that I just have to believe that people's hearts are right. They want to see people saved. They want to see people prayed with. They, they, they want to help high school students. They, 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 they want something to say to the person who's prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit 65 times and just can't seem to get through. They want to have something to say, well, it must just not be God's will for you. It's not out of a bad heart trying to, trying to dissuade people to receive from the Lord. It's not out of an evil intent to try and get people on a, on a wrong path. It's just, it's just a stepping away from the Holy Scriptures and saying something that makes some kind of humanistic sense. No, stay with the Scripture. Stay with the Bible. Let it define let it decide, let it determine, let it answer every question, let it solve every problem. And it will. Yeah. The Bible is perfect, it lacks nothing. It lacks nothing. The last thing Jesus said, he said twice. He said twice to John, excuse me, to Peter, right here in the book of John. Peter and John were there together. And, and, and he said in verse 19, what are the last two words of verse 19? If you don't have your Bible open, if you've quit on me and, 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 and given out, look at it right here. Here it is. See it? What are they? Follow me. Louder? Follow me. Everybody together? Follow me. Follow me. That's what Jesus said. Follow me. Now look at, look at Peter, verse 20. And Peter turned around to see the disciple who Jesus loved. That was John. Following, who also had leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayed you? That, that was all John. And Peter, seeing him, said, Lord Jesus, what shall this man do? And Jesus said, if it's my will that he lives until I return, what is that to you? Don't you love Jesus? How, how straight he is? Huh? Don't put your stuff away. Let's all just stand. Just, just, just real reverently, let's just stand. I said, don't you love Jesus and how direct he is and how straight he is? What's that to you? Well, they're having their 17th baby. What's that to you? We had some neighbors that had 19. Yeah, I'm not making it up. The Venettas, yeah, they, yeah one of our neighbors down, down in the southern part of the state had 19 kids. That was back when you could pick up the phone real quiet and listen to what the neighbors were talking about. Rubber neck. And some of you don't even know some of that. You got cell phones. You never even had a landline. We would pick it up so slow. And boy, they'd be talking. Did you hear the Venetas are having another baby? I can't believe they're having another baby. They've already got 18 babies. What do they have to have another baby for? They've got babies having babies. <laughs> they're going to have grandkids older than their own kids. All that mess. What do you care? Did you see they just got a new car? They just got a new car. What do they need three new cars for? Now they're going to have to have an eight-car garage. You got your eyes on too many people when you're, when you're all bent out of shape about what other folks are doing. Peter, raise your right hand. Say your own name out loud right now. Okay, whatever your name is. But he said, Peter, you follow me. Peter didn't even get one more step. And he's turned around and says, well, yeah, but what about him? What about them? What about her? And what about her? Jesus, what about her? And Jesus said, you know, if it's my will that she becomes the next pope, if it's my will that he becomes, you know, the next king, if it's my will that, that, that he, he becomes a, a, the next head of the New York Stock Exchange, you know, what do you care? What do you care, really? What business is that of yours? You follow me. So today we've covered evangelism and how God's will is that everyone progress and continue to walk and become a disciple of his. Be taught and instructed. Have a pastor. Have a local church. Be baptized. That's God's will for everybody. We've looked at God's will for everyone is to be a recipient and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the last thing he said in the book of Luke. And then we've read for everyone the Lord's will is you follow me you follow me don't get caught up with anybody else you follow me keep your eyes fixed on your Savior on your eternal soon coming King on your Lord
in his will for you, you follow him. I have decided to follow Jesus. I uh, have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, and though none go with me, still I will follow. Don't be too concerned about everybody else. You follow Jesus. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 815 and 1030, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.